Good evening. I'm Professor Naomi Sokoloff, and it's my honor to welcome you to tonight's talk, the second in the Strom Lecture Series for 2003. I've been a member of the Jewish Studies faculty here at University of Washington since 1985. For several years, I served as chair of the program, and recently I've been appointed to the Samuel and Althea Strom Endowed Chair in Jewish Studies. For all these reasons, I've been in a special position to appreciate the Strom family's support for our program and their instrumental role in establishing and furthering Jewish studies on our campus. We maintain a wide range of activities for students, faculty, and the community. Each year, the jewel in the crown of the Jewish Studies program is the Strom Lecture Series. On this special occasion, we thank the Stroms again for their continuing efforts on our behalf, and we're especially happy to see Althea Strom here in the audience with us. Our speaker tonight is Professor Chava Weisler of Lehigh University, where she holds the Philip and Muriel Berman Chair of Jewish Civilization. She has distinguished herself as a scholar in religious studies and folklore, and has been recognized especially for her path-breaking work on Jewish women's prayer and spirituality. Her current research focuses on the Jewish renewal movement, and on Monday night she began her series of talks called Jewish Spirituality in America. As I was thinking over her last lecture, what came to my mind was the Hebrew saying from Pirkei Avot, Ezehu Chacham Halomed Mikol Adam, that is, who is wise? The person who learns from everyone. It occurs to me that this saying can be an apt description of the ethnographic participant observer, none more than Chava Weisler. She comes to her work on the Jewish renewal movement as someone who is learned in Jewish texts and traditions and who brings with her extensive knowledge of Jewish popular movements from previous centuries. At the same time, she collects information by observing a range of people, conducting interviews, and listening to many different voices. She does not limit her focus to charismatic leaders, but rather is interested in all who are a part of the renewal movement. One of her overarching questions is, what can we learn from them? What are American Jews seeking in contemporary Jewish life? This project strikes me as lively and exciting, making for a special kind of wisdom, because of the way Professor Weisler combines historical understanding with inquiry into Jewish life as it is being lived today and as it is emerging in new directions. Last Monday, she spoke about the development of Jewish renewal within the religious marketplace of American society. She outlined the prominent characteristics of the movement, and she discussed the people in it and some of their folkways, including their shopping habits and what they like to eat. <laughs> she promised to tell us more in the second lecture about who joins this movement and how gender issues shape their perspectives on Judaism. Uh, the title for tonight's presentation is Gender and Jewish Renewal. Um, and now please join me in welcoming back Chava Weisler. Thank you, uh, Naomi, for a very lovely and gracious introduction. It's a pleasure to be back here and to see who actually comes just for me and not for the reception. Um, and <laughs> also uh, a pleasure to see uh, Althea Strum here again and uh, many members of the Seattle Jewish Renewal community and especially also to see uh, Rabbi Daniel Siegel who is the rabbinical director of Aleph visiting Seattle. Let me start with a brief quote, uh, very brief, uh, by, uh, I asked a, a woman uh, why it was that there were so many women in Jewish renewal and she said to me, this will stand as the epigraph, um, because God's coming through the women this time. <laughs> in my first lecture, I outlined the seven major characteristics of the Jewish renewal movement the centrality of the quest for an experiential relationship with the divine, the use of Jewish tradition as a flexible resource with emphasis on Kabbalah and Hasidism, the openness to other religious traditions, the importance of charismatic leadership, the participation in American therapeutic culture, the commitment to tikkun olam, social justice, and most significantly for tonight's presentation, 
renewal's explicit feminism and predominantly female membership. Tonight, I'll discuss the sociological and psychological roots and the theological and ritual ramifications of this aspect of renewal. As I mentioned at the end of my last lecture, the majority of participants in Jewish renewal, although only about half the leaders, are women. This clearly reflects what historians call the feminization of American religion, the predominance of women in American religious life since the 19th century. As religion has become identified in American culture with the private domain and thus with the emotional, expressive, and relational life, it has been increasingly identified with women. This is even more the case in various newer and new age spiritualities. By contrast, Judaism's public ritual life has historically been dominated by men, and men are still a predominant presence in orthodoxy and in more traditional conservative Judaism. Thus, renewal's gender distribution seems more exceptional in the Jewish context than in the American context. Nonetheless, it can be illuminating to ask why fewer men than women are attracted to Jewish renewal and what aspects of renewal appeal especially to women or express women's voices, experiences, and spiritualities. Many renewal Jews, when I asked them about the predominance of women among renewal's members, gave me what they took to be the simple and obvious answer. Jewish renewal attracts women because it is feminist or because it is open to women's equal participation. Yet this seemingly simple answer conceals more than it reveals. First, it obscures the other question, why is renewal less attractive proportionately to men unless they're leaders or teachers? Um, after examining the profile of renewal Jews, I'll argue that men, for a variety of reasons I'll explore, have more options for Jewish life than women and more reasons to be reluctant to affiliate with renewal. Further, just these same sociological and psychological characteristics are attractive to women. Next, I'll turn to renewal's feminist theology and its distinctive God language. I'll look at the recovery of the Kabbalistic image of the, of the feminine divine, the Shekhinah, or imminent presence of God. In that discussion, I'll also unpack the term feminism and investigate the varieties of feminism found in Jewish renewal. We'll see that there's more than one kind of feminism among renewal Jews and that conflicts arise from the differences. In the final section of tonight's talk, which will be relatively brief, I'll begin a discussion of renewal's liturgy and ritual, stressing especially the valorization of embodiment of our physicality, um, especially as expressed in music uh, and movement used in worship services and how this relates to feminist ritual and theology. Okay, now let me give you a thumbnail sketch of the membership of Jewish renewal. Uh, in order to explore the gender issues by renewal, I'll need to turn from my discussion in my previous lecture of what renewal is and to spend some time on the discussion of who renewal Jews are. So here's the promised um, discussion of who joins renewal. There are no statistics available, and I haven't done survey research. There are no statistics available on the number of members of Aleph and their breakdown by age and gender. Although someone was telling me after my last lecture that there are such statistics for people who come to the Kala and I would like to get my hot little hands on them. Nonetheless, I do have the impression from my participant observation at numerous renewal events um, about the makeup of the movement. In general, two thirds of, to three quarters of the participants at the events I've attended are women and sometimes virtually all of the participants are women. The majority of the participants are baby boomers but some are as young as their 20s, and some are as old as 70s and 80s. Renewal welcomes gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered people, and just as there are more women in, re in general in renewal, there are many more lesbians than gay men involved. Many renewal Jews have grown children. There is also a significant number of families with younger children. I'm not certain of the proportion to singles, of singles to couples. Suffice it to say that both are a significant part of the membership. Many members of Renewal are married to non-Jews, have a non-Jewish parent, or have some other complexities of their religious affiliation. Just this morning, I was looking at the Aleph Pnei Or um, members uh, uh, listserv, and uh, somebody remarked, if I remember correctly, 
that perhaps within a few years over half the uh, uh, membership of Renewal might be Jews by choice or people who weren't even Jewish. I don't actually know whether there's any kind of statistical basis for this, but it's interesting that it's an object of discussion. I can also make some rough generalizations about the kinds of people most attracted to Renewal. A great many of them, especially of the women, are artists. Painters, weavers, potters, writers, photographers, musicians, dancers. Some are professional artists. For example, Liz Lerman, a renewal Jew who has recently received a MacArthur Fellowship for her work in dance. For others, art is an avocation with an important place in their lives. Another significant occupational group for both women and men is the helping professions, primarily psychotherapists, but also physicians, teachers, massage therapists, physical and occupational therapists. Except for medicine, these are, of course, professions dominated by women. Finally, some people are attracted to Jewish Renewal's left-wing politics. Many of these work in or support socially conscious nonprofit organizations. Interestingly, of the five Jewish Renewal Life Center retreats I attended a few years ago in Philadelphia, the only one to attract significant male participation was devoted in part to political questions. Most people who are drawn to renewal are spiritual seekers. What sets them on this search? In my previous lecture, I looked at this question from a sociological point of view. That is, how and why contemporary American society has become a quest society that fosters a spirituality of seeking. Tonight, I'm looking at the question from a psychological point of view. What motivates individuals to seek out Jewish renewal? While the answers to this question can be various, there's one factor that motivates a significant proportion of them, not all of them, of course, but a significant proportion, some sort of trauma. Many are cancer survivors. Others have suffered severe physical injury. Some have lost deeply loved family members, including children. Still others grew up under very difficult family conditions. All of these factors can cause one to question the meaning and value of life as one has lived it and search for a new way and a deeper meaning. There is, of course, no guarantee that such a quest will send a Jew to renewal rather than Buddhism or Hasidism. And in fact, the sociologist Deborah Kaufman in her study of women who uh, became involved, uh, non-religious Jewish women who became involved in, uh, in Lubavitch Hasidism found exactly the same feature of their life histories, uh, some sort of, of, of trauma in life. A life crisis can even lead, uh, actually, to Buddhism, Hasidism, renewal, or even uh, deeper involvement with conservative Judaism. There's all sorts of ways that people respond to some sort of life crisis, but renewal is one of the places that people um, who've experienced these crises seem to look. And even people who grew up as Orthodox may also come to renewal out of a trauma that calls that previous framework into question. Many people active in renewal have already been involved in various other alternative spiritualities, from Hare Krishna to Chabad, and some combine Jewish renewal with Buddhist mindfulness meditation, Native American-style shamanism, or other spiritual practices. Further, some combine renewal with other, more mainstream branches of Judaism, Reconstructionist, Reform, Conservative, or Orthodox. For some who may regularly attend retreats at Elat Chaim or the Kala, there are no Jewish renewal communities where they live, and so they are members of other sorts of Jewish congregations. Others may live in a place that offers a wide variety of Jewish affiliations, and they may, they may be members of or daven at several, including renewal. Um, examples uh, in, in Berkeley, the, uh, where people are members of Kihila, uh, a renewal congregation, may also daven at Nativot Shalom, which is a conservative congregation, or in Philadelphia, my, my uh, sort of home base, in this, uh, people who daven at both Pnei Or, the renewal community, and Dorshe Derech, which is a reconstructionist uh, minion that meets in a conservative synagogue. So uh, you've got a patchwork there. For many, the question may not be whether or not they are renewal Jews, but what part Jewish renewal plays in their spiritual economy. And let me recall the young woman I quoted last time who said, uh, when I think about God, I'm a reconstructionist. When I daven, I'm renewal, and then there's that little bit of Buddhism. Um, so, you know, I was talking last time about how people pull together 
uh, different elements to make up a meaningful spirituality for themselves. Uh, people involved in renewal may also be involved in other forms of Jewish life as well as other spiritualities. So let me just sum this up and highlight some important points. Jewish renewal attracts and is informed by the sensibilities of people with artistic and intuitive minds and people who either through professional training or personal experience or both have a high investment in exploring emotional issues and healing and sustaining relationships. A certain appreciation for sensu sensuality and physicality goes along with these characteristics as I'll mention briefly uh, later in the lecture. Note that these qualities are coded female in contemporary American culture. This is not to say that there are no male artists or therapists, simply that these are understood as particularly feminine qualities in our own culture. I mean, I was thinking about the contrast with various European cultures where um, to be a poet, a painter, a musician is a masculine thing to do. Uh, a couple of years ago, I heard a popular French song in which uh, the narrator, uh, a young man, was trying to impress a woman he saw, and he tried to get her to think he was a poet to impress her. That's not probably something that would occur to most young men in American society. <laughs> so I'm just showing you that the way these things are coded in our, in, in, in our society. Okay. So with a clearer sense of what characterizes the members of Jewish renewal, we can now begin to explore the question of gender in renewal. Why does renewal attract women, and why doesn't it attract men to the same degree? Let me begin with a negative question. It seems to me that there are three reasons that fewer men proportionately are attracted to renewal. Men have more reason to be satisfied with, quote, mainstream, unquote, Judaism. They have more options available than women if they are dissatisfied, and some of them may be put off by renewal's explicit gender egalitarianism and by the overall ethos, coded female, that I've outlined above. As we all know, until very recently, Judaism carefully distinguished between male and female roles. While, as I've shown in my earlier research on women's Yiddish prayers, women did have active spiritual lives, they could not participate in the public world of religious expression. Women could not be rabbis, cantors, teachers, except of little girls, witnesses, or count in a minion. This has changed in all of the liberal branches of Judaism over the past several decades, although there is a debate about just what including women means, a debate that renewal engages, as I'll discuss below. Nonetheless, the great classics of Judaism, the Hebrew Bible, the Talmud, the Midrash, the prayer book, the Zohar, were all composed by men out of their own religious sensibilities. One renewal Jew whom I interviewed was Barbara Brightman, a psychotherapist in the Philadelphia area. She's also one of the directors of uh, the Jewish Renewal Spiritual uh, Direction Program, the Lev Shomea, the Listening Heart Program. Uh, she put it this way, men see their needs being met by the tradition in ways that women don't because the tradition was created primarily by men. Fewer men have been disturbed by the traditional liturgy and forms. Men have felt as though the tradition does reflect their needs. You have to be a much more countercultural or progressive man to be interested in this kind of exploratory relationship to Judaism. Women just have to be a little bit countercultural. It follows from this that even men who are dissatisfied with mainstream Judaism, um, again, mainstream in quotes, may have more alternatives available to them than women do. One of Renewal's strongest critiques of mainstream Judaism is its lack of spirituality. As I emphasized in my last lecture, a major characteristic of Renewal is the focus on an experiential relationship with God. Unlike other American Jews, Renewal Jews speak freely of God and strive for closeness with the divine. They may do this, as I said, through meditation and contemplation, or through ecstatic worship shot through with singing, chanting, and dance. Men who are attracted to renewal for the ecstatic spiritual experience, what the sociologist of religion Emile Durkheim calls effervescence, can go to Hasidic communities either as visitors or potential members. Women in Hasidic communities don't have the same access to the ecstatic. A third factor is the way some men feel in explicitly egalitarian settings. 
One person I interviewed has thought deeply about this question. Um, Rabbi Avram Davis, the director of Chachmat Halev, the Wisdom of Heart Meditation Center in Berkeley, whom I first met when he led a retreat at the Jewish Renewal Life Center in Philadelphia a few years ago. I don't know if it's nature or nurture, he said, but men need dominance. There are certain symbolic ways that it is hard for males to function unless they feel in power. If men feel disempowered, they just don't show up. Gender equality, other sorts of egalitarianism, and an absence of hierarchical organization are explicit values of renewal, even though beneath the surface, there are a variety of kinds of hierarchy, especially the power and authority held by charismatic teachers. Davis remarked that fundamentalist groups, um, those that hew to a gender ideology of male dominance, are full of men. Uh, and I guess that includes Hasidism. He explained that if it's all women leading a service, the men will get very twitchy and vice versa. And while women, if they feel disempowered, will, as he's put it, get crabby and in your face about it, men simply don't come back. If Davis is right about this, which he may or may not be, but even if his, he's got some interesting instincts here, we can understand more clearly why certain men do participate. If power and dominance are important issues, this helps explain why there's such a high proportion of male leaders and teachers. They are in the dominant position. As for the members, there must be strong reasons for an attraction that rules out other choices, or at least makes renewal one of the important choices for a man. My data so far on this are only anecdotal, but I note one interview with a man with strong commitment from childhood to gender and race egalitarianism. Clearly, certain sorts of traditional Jewish communities would not appeal to him. Other men who love the music, the chanting, the drumming, the ecstatic, may have extremely limited knowledge of Hebrew and Jewish practice, which would make more traditional communities uncomfortable for them. In addition, some men are strongly committed to the politics supported by renewal, usually not found elsewhere in the Jewish community, at least maybe in the West Coast they are, I'm not sure, but not in the East Coast. As one interviewee remarked, men in renewal are those who want to connect with their more vulnerable, intuitive, and creative selves. If you'll pardon my using a stereotypical term, they are sensitive New Age guys. These are not qualities that are coded masculine in our culture. Thus, the greatest barrier to some men's participation in renewal, and one of the most important characteristics encouraging women's participation, is that renewal's ethos is created by people who are intuitive, creative, and tuned into relationships. Okay, so we've explored some of the reasons for men's reluctance to join renewal and for women's greater comfort in the movement. Another aspect of renewal's feminism is its theology, and uh, you know, don't get nervous about the term theology. I'm using it in a simple, literal sense. Theology in, in Greek simply means talking about God, God talk. So I'm, I want to talk about how people talk about God in renewal. Renewal is explicit about using feminist and gender-neutral God language. Nonetheless, there are tensions underlying renewal's theological choices. As we continue the discussion, we'll see that the major, what the major feminist critiques of Judaism are and how renewal grapples with them. We'll also look at how conflict between essentialist and social, constructive, social constructivist feminism, which I'll explain later, plays itself out in renewal. Feminist theologians have developed a critique of Western monotheistic traditions, including Judaism. And so I just want to say this is, this is part of a broader problem. Um, the problems that feminists in Jewish renewal or that the Jewish renewal grapples with uh, are not unique to Jewish renewal, but some of their creative solutions uh, may be unique to it. Um, briefly and simply discussing Judaism, the feminist cr critique includes, at least some of the, uh, some of the feminist cr critique includes the following. Uh, first, Jewish sacred texts, traditions, rituals, and conceptions of God have been formed by men and thus reflect men's experiences and religious concerns. Thus, perhaps something needs to change, in the most general way to put it, for women to become equal participants in Judaism. Feminists within conservative Judaism might say what needs to change is women's access. Women need to be able to study Torah and Talmud along with men. They need to be able to become rabbis and cantors. But the texts themselves, the services and the rituals, according to 
feminist and conservative Judaism, don't need to change, or at least not very much. Just the addition of the four matriarchs to the three patriarchs and a few other little changes. Reconstructionist and renewal feminists, however, argue that greater changes are needed. As one renewal rabbi, a woman, told me, equal access isn't enough, she said, we women in renewal, we didn't just want to get dressed up in a suit and go to shul like men. We wanted to create something of our own. Another critique by feminist theologians has to do with the kind of imagery and language the Western traditions use for God and how it reinforces social structures and hierarchies. As we all know, the Torah and the prayer book, the Talmud and the Midrash, overwhelmingly imagine God in masculine terms. Which classic work that I mentioned before did I leave out? We're going to come to it in a minute. God, language, and social structure, feminists argue, are intimately intertwined. God was called king in biblical times because kings were the most honored and powerful members of society. God was called lord because lords command. God was called father because fathers are the heads of the household. Further, kings, lords, and fathers are men, symbolizing and reinforcing the dominance of men over women. Thus, feminist theologians argue, if we recognize that women are as fully human, as fully created in the image of God as men, this means that we have, to, we have come to recognize the limitations and oppressive nature of male God language. We need to find new ways to speak of God, perhaps using feminine imagery, perhaps using more neutral terms. Further, feminists argue for democratic and non-hierarchical social organization and thus strive for non-hierarchical God language. Many renewal Jews accepting these points don't like to speak of God as king or lord and try to find alternatives. Um, and let me add parenthetically that some liberal Jews of other movements find, uh, have similar difficulties with traditional ways of speaking about God. It is for just this reason that renewal Jews turn to Kabbalah. Jewish mysticism is the only major strand of Jewish tradition that contains significant feminine imagery for the divine. This all sounds very academic, but encountering a feminist conception of God can transform a life. Let me quote a woman I interviewed in Los Angeles, one who introduced herself by saying, I said I was looking to interview renewal Jews, she said, I am renewal. <laughs> in some ways, a typical spiritual seeker, this woman, coming from a secular Jewish background and married to an Orthodox man, had been involved in both Hare Krishna and Chabad before settling in Jewish, into Jewish renewal in the early 1990s. And she still actually, you know, maintains her connections with orthodoxy. So this is one of these cases of hybridity. A crucial step along the way was her involvement in Jewish feminism in Los Angeles in the 1980s with figures such as Savina Tobal, Judith Halevi, Halevi, and Sue Elwell themselves identified in various ways with renewal. My informant stated, Feminism gave me the ability to worship a God who isn't the Lord. I quoted this last time, too. Not long after, she began to attend the Kala and Elat Chaim, where she learned how to shape her spiritual practice to her new understanding of divinity. I start the morning by greeting the sun. I go out in my bare feet and dance in the garden as the sun is coming up. Remember, this is LA, not Seattle. Um, <laughs> I go out in my bare feet and dance in the garden as the sun is coming up and say the mode ani. I learned it from Shefa Gold, one of the great uh, composers of, of, of renewal uh, liturgy. I learned it from Shefa Gold at the Kala in 1993. I learned that I could be free and liberated to express myself in ways I didn't know I could. So this woman's life changed as she began to Worship a God who isn't the Lord. So if you don't speak about God as the Lord, how do you speak about God? A variety of alternatives are used from a variety of sources, and these move in two basic directions. For the first, non-anthropomorphic images are preferred, such as wellspring, breath, and spirit. One woman spoke of God as being life, being with a capital B, Life with a capital L. When I was interviewing her, she said that's a capital B, a capital L, um, and also a process that is larger than ourselves. God may be referred to as Ein Hachayim, the source or wellspring of life, drawing on the liturgical work of Marcia Falk, who is not herself actually associated with renewal, 
or Ruach HaOlam, spirit of the universe, substituted for Melech HaOlam, king of the universe. Perhaps the most widely used term is the biblical Yah, a shortened form of the tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God, um, Yah as in hallelujah, praise God, which some renewal Jews pronounce in such a way as to recall the breath of life, Yah. And some also erroneously take to be grammatically feminine. The other direction that they go, that people can go in renewal, besides these, um, you could say, um, non-anthropomorphic gender-neutral images, is to find feminine images for God. This can be a simple and rather mechanical substitution of grammatically feminine for masculine terms, imeno malkatenu, our mother, our queen, instead of avinu malkenu, our father, our king, or brucha at ya shechina, elohatenu ruach haolam, blessed are you, ya shechina, the divine presence, our goddess, our feminine god in the feminine form, spirit of the universe. However, in a move that is more subtle and complex, renewal explicitly recognizes and articulates the importance of the Shekhinah, the feminine divine of Jewish mysticism. Let me give you a little background on the Kabbalah, the actual classical Kabbalah on this. According to classic Kabbalistic texts, divinity is truly, so this is, I'm giving you the classic Kabbalistic view of God in a very quick nutshell. Um, according to Kabbalah, divinity is truly in, infinite and unknowable. This aspect of the Godhead is called Ainsof or infinity. This infinite divinity manifests and reveals itself in the ten sefirot or attributes known by such names as Chachma and Bina, wisdom and understanding, Chesed and Din or Gvura, loving kindness and stern judgment. Some of these are seen as having masculine and some others as feminine qualities. The tenth and last sphira, the, sort of the place as the unfolding of God proceeds that comes right before the created world, is the Shekhinah, most consistently imagined as feminine, not always, but often, the divine presence and imminence in the world. And let, let me also say um, uh, uh, that all religions, um, all Western monotheistic religions, struggle between um, and have tendencies to work towards regarding God as both transcendent and imminent. The transcendent God is the God who is far from us, who is the powerful creator. The imminent God is God's presence right here, God's presence that fills create, creation. Um, and a central myth of the Kabbalah is that the brokenness of this world, the fact that we live with exile, evil, pain, and death, is an expression of the exile or eclipse of the Shekhinah, her separation from the rest of the Sfirot, and especially from her divine spouse, Tiferet, or beauty, often referred to as the Kadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be He. So, and to a certain extent, it's also a split, an exile between the transcendent and the imminent God. This exile began with the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, at least according to uh, earlier Kabbalistic sources, and will end in the Messianic era. Further, in classical Kabbalah, the Shekhinah is an ambivalent figure. While in exile, she's sometimes subject to the power of the forces of evil and can be turned to their ends, becoming harsh and punitive. This reflects, perhaps, the ambivalence male Kabbalists felt about women, but it also speaks to our experience of life as painful and unpredictable. For the Kabbalists, this myth is primarily about the fate of the people of Israel. For the Hasidim, it is about the life of the soul. Some renewal Jews have adapted this myth as a way to frame gender issues. This, the exile or eclipse of the Shekhinah refers to the absence of women's voices and feminine spirituality from Judaism. Interestingly, the Shekhinah of Jewish renewal lacks, at least usually, the dark side found in Kabbalistic sources. And this is an interesting thing, and I, I, I hope to return to it next time. Um, uh, there's, there's a classic article on feminist theology published in the Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion. Of course, I can't remember the name of the author. But anyway, the title is, If God is God, She is Not Nice. Um, and... Um, it points to the difficulties 
that pe if people who are involved in feminist spirituality have with recognizing or grappling with the dark side of God. Um, and I think this, this happens to a certain extent in renewal as well. I think it's also part of what the uh, psychologist of religion, William James, called uh, the problem of healthy-mindedness in American religion, sort of like, let's keep our chin up and look on the bright side. So I think this sometimes affects renewal's idea of the Shekhinah as well. In any case, um, further, as we shall see, those who prefer speaking about Shekhinah tend to think of God, in, it's, it's, it's speaking of God as Shekhinah, tend to think in terms of a complementary rather than an egalitarian version of gender relations, and I will explain these terms in a minute. Okay. In some renewal services, members are explicitly invited to choose the name of God they prefer to use in the course of the service. Yah, Shekhinah, Adonai, or something else. The assumption is that because God is so far beyond our grasp, there are many different ways to imagine God, and each person should choose the one meaningful to him or her. Yet behind this pluralism, there are some tensions between different theologies. And note that here, rather than being a struggle between women and men, the issue at hand is one of different conceptions of feminism, with both women and men on both sides. On the one hand, there is essentialist or complementary feminism, and on the other, social constructivist or egalitarian feminism. The first position is that men and women are essentially different in important ways. The way to achieve a just society or to heal Judaism of its sexism, to bring the Shekhinah out of her exile, is to revalue the feminine in order to incorporate women's nurturing qualities and sensitivities to nature and relationships into a renewed society or renewed Judaism. The second position is that while men and women do indeed differ biologically, and maybe even in brain structure, most gender roles are social constructions rather than expressing innate or essential qualities of the sexes. The way to achieve a just society or to heal Judaism of its sexism, according to this view, is to reveal the constructed rather than natural character of gender roles, thus freeing women and men to participate on an equal footing in whatever ways they choose without prejudging what masculine and feminine spirituality or other qualities might be. Let me also note that while feminist theorists carefully distinguish between essentialism and constructivism, most renewal Jews don't. When I explained the difference to them, many of my interviewees told me that they took a position somewhere in between the two. Within renewal, people who take the essentialist position tend to prefer to speak of the Shekhinah and to see women as uniquely capable of bringing Shekhinah energy back into Judaism, or in the mythological terms of the Kabbalah, to restore the Shekhinah from her eclipse or exile. This was, in fact, one of Zalman Shachter Shalomi's original motivations for involving women more fully in the life of Jewish renewal. According to an interview with Arthur Waskow, this view was often found among those men in renewal who, like Zalman, came from a Hasidic background where men and women do have very distinct roles. But the essentialist position is expressed by many women as well. Um, a fully articulated essentialist position is expressed by Hannah Tiferet Siegel, a well-known renewal leader and Eshet Chazon in, a lyrics, in the lyrics to a song she composed. She may express other views in other of her works, but in any case, it's a very interesting song. The ways of a woman a man cannot know, he does not understand. The cycles, the seasons, the ebb and the flow, the prayers of the earth are the secrets women know. We sing the song of Shekhinah, bringing us all home, lifting us on wings of light to a place we've always known. We sing the song of Shekhinah, waiting to be heard. The ways of a woman are the ways of life. There's, powers in our wor There's power in our words. It goes on from there. But um, notice here the intertwining of God as Shekhinah with a view of women that connects them, shows their unique capacities to connect to natural cycles and the earth. The ways of women are mysterious to men, according to Tiferet Siegel, um, and, uh, and uh, distinctly connected um, to, uh, to nature and the cyclical, uh, the cyclical realm. 
Also, the idea that Shekhinah is bringing women home or all of us home. Uh, okay, the social constructionists within renewal tend to, speak, to prefer to speak of God in non-anthropomorphic terms. Here, let me quote Barbara Brightman discussing the power of renewal for women. Women have the opportunity now to come into the fullness of who we can be. As we know from the Exodus story, the story of people making that journey from enslavement to the fullness of humanity, there's something about the process of moving from oppression or enslavement or severe limitation. The journey into selfhood enables us to be more open and receptive to and connected with being, a process that lar that's larger than our individual selves. The experience of internet connectedness with each other and with life is a spiritual process. Note Brightman's use of being and life for God, along with her analysis of the reasons for women's spiritual creativity in renewal. Brightman argues that the specific circumstances of women's liberation from what she calls oppression is what shapes their spirituality. That is, there's a specific historical circumstance here. Women are experiencing an exodus. And that's what shapes their spirituality, not, not their essential nature as women. Social constructivists within renewal can be quite critical of the essentialists, although I have not heard much criticism going in the other direction. And I would be interested, uh, maybe I just haven't talked to the right people yet. Essentialist feminism is bullshit, one of the constructivists said in an interview. And I tend to close my eyes to its presence in renewal. The social constructivists see the essentialist use of Shekhinah or regendering brachot as a mechanical approach, one that does not really get to the heart of the theological problems of hierarchical representations of divinity. Um, they further argue that talk of the eclipse of Shekhinah obscures the real barriers to real women and tends to cloud over with myth the hard work of achieving gender equality within Judaism. Thus, there's room for disagreement among renewal Jews about the nature of gender, about God and our ways of imagining God, and about how Judaism means to chain, change to incorporate women as well as men as equal partners in Jewish life. A final area of importance in an analysis of gender issues in renewal is the transformation of Jewish ritual. Most importantly, the actual performance of the liturgy in worship, the davening. This evening, I will only have time to enter into a brief discussion of this topic and to set up some categories. I'll return to a full description of the davening and a detailed analysis of it in my final lecture. Whatever form of God language is employed, renewal davening embraces both an emotional pietism, effervescence or enthusiasm, and the quest for embodiedness in spirituality. In common with other feminist spiritualities, Jewish renewal valorizes, revalues our physical being and connection to the earth. As feminist theorist Leslie Northup writes about feminist rituals, whatever their source, whether old or new, body rituals ground women in the world in a space where creatures that walk, crawl, lie supine, squat, grow, ache, laugh, touch, moan, and regenerate are more sacred than those that float eternally insensate in the clouds. In renewal, this is expressed in forms of worship that incorporate chanting, singing, and dancing. Participants describe this movement towards physicality as related to the reclamation of female experience. According to Judith Plasco, one of this generation's leading feminist theologians of Judaism, this embodied quality of ritual is one of, means that it is one of the most important uh, kinds of feminist expression, unquote. Ritual, because it involves the whole self, is potentially a more effective vehicle for communication of a total conception of the sacred. The rejection of hierarchical leadership in feminist ritual, its preference for circles, its participatory style of prayer that seeks to empower all present, offer testimony to a feminist conception of God that is as powerful as any new metaphor. These qualities that are discussed by Plasco are indeed exemplified in Renewal's style of prayer. While I'll go into much more detail in my final lecture, let me give a very brief description here of a Shabbat morning service at Eilat Chaim. And now I actually do need the pictures, yes. At about 10 in the morning, 
people who have come for a weekend retreat begin to file into the yurt. That's the yurt here, the yurt, a circular tent-like structure. This is not, by the way, a picture that was taken on Shabbat. It is, as you can see by the fact that people are wearing tefillin, um, it's, uh, it, it's a weekday. Um, and also, it's, uh, it's during the month of Elul, which is why the people in the picture are blowing the shofar. Um, people begin to file into the yurt, a circular tent light stru structure with a polished wooden platform floor for services. The room is laid out in a circle. In the center are meditation cushions and back jacks, surrounded by two concentric circles of metal chairs. Some of the daveners, women and men, are wearing jeans and t-shirts. Others wear tailored slacks and shirts. A number of both sexes, you can't actually see this in this picture, have donned flowing robes, either white in honor of the Sabbath or in soft, gauzy colors. colors. Most of the daveners have their heads covered with embroidered kipot, scarves, even a baseball cap or two. I showed you the baseball cap last time. I don't know if I see one in this picture. Some wear traditional prayer shawls, white with blue or black stripes, while others have added the ritual fringes to a length of African print cloth or a lace tablecloth. And here you can see these very colorful tali tote. Um, still others, finally, have donned the rainbow stripe pne or talit, a sign of allegiance to the Jewish renewal movement. Note the informality of dress and a certain sensuality of colors loose and, and loose garments. As the daveners settle into a circle on cushions or chairs, the leader, a woman in her 50s in flowing purple robes, who is not in this picture, actually the leader here is Goldie Milgram, who's sitting there wearing a pair of shorts, um, begins to sing, and soon everyone is singing along, swaying in their seats to the music, eyes closed. As the service continues, the singing becomes more animated. Worshippers take maracas or tambourines or rattles from a basket of percussion instruments on the floor and keep time with the music. Some rise and dance spontaneously while others meditate with their eyes closed. As the daveners reach Shacharit, the heart of the morning service, both the, the davening becomes more, much more similar to the traditional liturgy, although worshippers are invited to go outside and meditate during the Amida if they prefer to that to reciting the traditional prayers. So what's happening in this service? Tonight I can just begin to make a few points. We see the circular arrangement, the participatory style of worship that involves all in the singing, chanting, and movement, elements described by Plasco. Music was crucial to Jewish renewal worship, and a great many of the composers of the songs sung as part of the liturgy are women. Chanting can help the worshipers to feel deep emotion and involvement, and in some cases, trance or altered states of consciousness. Movement, whether ritualized or spontaneous, can have similar effect. The heart of a renewal davening is the physical and the emotional. As I've suggested, the valorization of the physical and the emotional is an important element of feminist theology. Since Western religions tend to see men as spiritual and women as physical, feminist theologians argue that the denigration of the body, the turn towards asceticism, is also a denigration of women. Reclaiming women's dignity, they say, involves valorizing our physical existence, seeing the body as holy. What's so interesting, though, is that in Hasidism, it's the men who do the singing and dancing. Anyway, it's a separate point. So some, some tentative conclusions here. As we've seen, renewal theology, liturgy, and worship are feminist in expression, whether that takes the form of essentialist or social constructionist feminism. Barbara Brightman, who says that she straddles the two, explains why renewal is so important for women. I like to think of renewal as the research and development wing of contemporary Judaism. In order for women to come into the fullness of who we can be as Jews, we need to create new liturgical and ritual forms. In renewal, that creativity is not only enabled, but celebrated. Renewal doesn't have a committee for, Jew for law and standards like conservative Judaism to adjudicate what's acceptable and what isn't. Rather, it has given women complete freedom. While, in fact, even in renewal there are limits, it does give very wide scope for creativity and exploration in relation to the sources, forms, and theological concepts of Judaism. There are important reasons why more women than men may want to exercise this freedom, 
Men have more alternatives and feel more at home in traditional Judaism. Further, the embodied and ecstatic Judaism found in renewal is in line with certain aspects of feminist theology. In my final lecture, I'll take another look with fuller description at the renewal davening and explore how renewal's feminism and its adaptations of Kabbalah come together. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Um, these are some just very, very basic questions. Uh, are the services conducted mostly in Hebrew or in English? Uh, are the songs in Hebrew? Do they have conversions and are they accepted by the rabbis? Okay, um, I will talk in greater detail about the services next time, but let me just say that both Hebrew and English are used in the services. The songs are in both Hebrew and English. Sometimes uh, one may chant a Hebrew verse from the prayers over and over again, sometimes with English translation, sometimes not. Um, sometimes songs may be sung that are, that are in English. Um, well, I mean, conversions, um, it depends which rabbis you're talking about. There are renewal rabbis. So uh, would renewal conversions be accepted by Orthodox rabbis? I actually don't know. I, I, I haven't actually gone into that topic, so I can't speak to it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes. OK, well. All right, you don't mind? No, go ahead. OK. I've had my conversions accepted by Orthodox rabbis. Oh, great. Great. OK, so um, here's some real data. We're doing a cross country. Uh, I, I, I'll go anywhere to hear Professor Weisler talk. I heard her in New York, and now I hear her here. Um, I just want to—I want to offer a comment similar to the one I made in New York. That um, it's very important to remember that uh, snapshots of reality are not reality. Mm -hmm. um, almost all the people who founded what we now call Jewish Renewal are still alive mm -hmm. and functioning, and so I hope. Anyway, I am. And, uh, and so the, the sense that, um, that, that we know what the picture is, you know, is I think in, always incomplete at this point. Mm -hmm. So I just want to offer my favorite anecdote about that, which was when, that when I began to work as the director of Aleph, I told the director of Arkala that I wanted to teach one day, and what I wanted to teach was a course in reading Talmud as a spiritual text. And she laughed at me, and she said, people don't come to the Kala to study text, much less to study Talmud. The Kala after that one, we had a class in Hasidic texts, 120 people, one, mm -hmm. whatever that is, one seventh or one sixth of the total Kala attended that class. Um, at the last Kala, I gave a workshop on reading Talmud as a spiritual text. I prepared for 20, and I had 120 people show up. So I think this is in flux all the time. Yes. I think that one of the things that is somehow overlooked in, in renewal is that what we have been doing is drawing to us those very people who are so distanced from their Judaism that no other place welcomes them, knows how to receive them, and can accept them, and therefore they don't feel comfortable. So it's a wonderful thing to be able to say to someone, you know how to do a meditation in this form? Come, you can lead us already. And meanwhile, we'll teach you some Hebrew and we'll teach you some other things. And so as people begin to learn these things, the quality of what happens changes. So there was a time when the curriculum at the Kala was much more eclectic than it is now. Now it's much more Jewish, in a sense, because the depth of the people coming is much greater because they've been around longer. So I just want to, uh, you know, just as in, in that same way, to put a, a fluidity into the conversation um, that allows what you're saying to, um, to be um, uh, what, it, what I think it really wants to be, and that is the ground for some incredibly deep thinking. I thank you for teaching me a lot tonight. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Rabbi Siegel. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.